Let's talk not physical, not physical. Let's talk not physical. Let's talk not physical. Let us have some spirit talk. Some spirit talk. Let us have some spirit talk. Oh, hi everybody. I'm here with Arlindo Batista, and we are reviewing a video of Donald Hoffman in the channel Impact Theory. And the name of the video is, Is Reality Real? And well, Arlindo is going to start uh, with the review. And we, what we did is also save the captions of the video. So we got the text that the video uh, showed. And, and then from the text, uh, we're going to do the review and give our opinions. So Arlindo, welcome to the channel. And Hi, uh, thank you for having you, me on, Claudio. You're welcome. And um, yeah, the, the, the first thing that jumped out at me from, um, from the video is the following. So he says, uh, what we are are avatars of the one the one awareness is exploring all of its possibilities through different avatars. So somehow there is this field of awareness that is in some sense deeply and fundamentally who you really are. And um, I don't know, what would you, uh, would you make of this? Do you want me to go into it or? Well, well what do you think about that? <clears throat> well, it makes me think um, it makes me think about the uh, definition of consciousness. So uh, I, I tend to think OK, before I absorb his concept of the one, I'm thinking I have my own consciousness, right? Uh, when I when I hear him say these words, it makes me think of Hindu concepts like, you know, the Atman and the Brahman. So the Atman is one soul and then the Brahman is the infinite and we're, we're all drops in this massive ocean. you know what's consciousness so consciousness is experience itself right it's you know it's the what it is like to be someone or something it can also include um self-awareness so it's it's the consciousness of self and i think to myself maybe we are not really the self you know maybe our identities uh, isn't really who we are. We're we're practically something deeper than that. You know, maybe these the, these identities that we have. You know, I'm Arlindo, you're Claudio. Uh, they're just fictions. But what we really are fundamentally is experience. Is is just consciousness. And we're. It makes me think that we're seeing ourselves from different perspectives, but we're all one. At some level, there's no separateness. I mean, what do you think? That's my take on it, practically. Yeah, maybe I mean, I'm guessing that you're, you might be relating to the higher self too, that there is a part of ourselves that is in the non-physical as well. I don't know if you refer to that. Um, do, do you think there is another part of our Lindo outside, I mean, in the non-physical? I do, I do, um, I do entertain the possibility because I've had some, um, and these are dream, they're non lucid dreams that I've had recently where I receive moral lessons from uh, dream characters, and uh, and and these experiences, these dreams I've had tend to be quite profound. You know, I'm being lectured by these dream characters about something that I've done, and they make me feel guilty and ashamed, uh, but I know they're right. And I think to myself, if, if if they're in my dream, and and obviously there's usually like some plot that you know you wake up and you think, well, I should have realised I was dreaming because that didn't really make sense. But those characters, they appear, and they and then they they point at something that I've been doing, and then they give me a profound uh, moral lecture. So it makes me think: is it possible that some part of me, something inside me is actually already connecting all the dots. So say like I'm I'm me right now and I'm trying to understand the world and I'm trying to connect the dots. I'm, I'm you know, uh, trying to uh, build this puzzle, this map of reality. But 
and I'm, I'm trying to make sense of things and I'm biased by this map, by what I have so far. And I tend to think, is that piece going to fit my puzzle? Is it going to make sense? And that leads me to um, to make mistakes because I'm biased, you know, because, you know, reality is often counterintuitive, right? We have our intuitions about reality, but sometimes we can be wrong. So it makes me think, is there some some part of me, some side to my mind that connects everything willy nilly, doesn't care about whether it makes sense or not. And because of that, it becomes more advanced than me. It, it becomes, uh, you know, it has more wisdom. And because yeah. of that, it can see far more than what I can see, you know. Yeah, it's it's beyond my ken. It, it's like I can't possibly imagine my full potential, but there's already the full potential there, if that makes sense. And then it makes me wonder: is this higher self, if it really exists? It feels like it does, because you know sometimes I have eureka moments, or or you know I have ideas, and I wonder where do they come from? You don't pick the moment when you have these ideas, you know they they just hit you, you know, and you're surprised. Oh wow. Where is that coming from? And, you know, ancient people used to think, oh, um, the gods sometimes send uh, ideas or, you know, revelations. But I, I, you know, I'm not really religious, but I'm, I tend to think along the lines of there's something there that's already all knowing, you know, because it's it is connected to reality at large. And I believe we can get in touch with this uh, this side of us, this other nature, which isn't really separate from us. I think that we are a part of it and perhaps the brain, you know, they tend to say that the brain generates consciousness. You know, they, the physicalists, they say it somehow emerges from from the brain. It's what the brain does. But I'm starting to wonder, especially recently, if it's the other way around if we if our experience before prior to the brain if our experience is already wide open and then the brain acts as some kind of narrowing of experience it limits us for the purpose like an avatar for the purpose of uh, e experiencing this reality right mm. actually you know, well, when you mentioned the uh, what you had in your dreams, that sounds to me a typical training. I mean, the common belief uh, are, that is spread around is that dreams come from the subconscious, from ourselves. But yeah. I, I kind of like disagree with that. I, I mean, it might be a component that the subconscious brings to the, to the realities we see in dreams. But the main components are I think are from outside. In my case, I would say I would call it my team. I mean, basically, uh, my team can be my higher self together with other entities that they want to. They care about my progress. And when you say you, when you mention your dreams, uh, I, I relate that I had dreams about fear that they want me to overcome those fears. So, so it's like it's like a training. Yeah. And anyway, go, going back to, I mean, analyzing the video, I, when, when it says what we are is avatars of the one, yeah. I, I don't think that's a good way of saying it because an avatar, I mean, if you, have you seen the movie Avatar? The first one? Yes, I have. Yeah, yeah. So in the in the movie, what is the avatar? They adopt these uh, these bodies. Some, if I remember this correctly, some somehow they transfer their consciousness right. to an alien body so that they're able to survive. Yeah. On so this so, so the avatar in the case is the alien body. Is that that tall being, that tall yeah. body? Let's say that's the avatar. But the avatar is not using uh, his uh, consciousness. I mean, it's the consciousness of the human, right? Yeah. So yeah. when he says we're, we are avatars of the one, I think I think it's, it's better to say it, we are 
uh, parts of the one, but as consciousness, not as avatars. We are we are yes. using avatars, but the avatars are not parts of the awareness. The avatars don't have awareness. So, so yes. I would have said it that we are units of consciousness using avatars. Yeah, that, that, that's the way I would have said it. Yeah, I think he says, um, uh, you know, it, it, his uh, worldview. Apparently, he, he subscribes to this um, conscious realism, and he makes the distinction. And this is what separates his view from uh, panpsychism. So panpsychism basically says that it's consciousness all the way down, and everything's conscious. That the mouse is the computer. Everything is absolutely conscious. Um, even an electron has some kind of experience. That's that's the claim from panpsychists. Mm. But his claim is different. He claims that there is this one awareness that experiences, it explores every possible qualia. So everything's qualia. And the objects around us aren't conscious mental constructs. Right, right, right. So it's yeah, yeah. So so in a way, it it kind of ties in with what you said. It's you know, even our bodies. We're not our bodies, but they're they're like uh, to use his computer analogy. They're icons on a desktop, you know. And he says, you know, he brings several arguments for it. You know, the stuff from physics, stuff from evolution. He says that we don't have to perceive the underlying reality. So he, he compares it to uh, programming and electronics and he says we don't have to um, to be aware of that in order to to interact with the interface efficiently. So right now at, as human beings, all we need to be concerned with is the uh, you know, the interface, the desktops, the icons, but obviously we don't if we want to explore further, then we have to expand our science. We have to try somehow to to go beyond the headset, you know. Yeah, there, there is something in the in the video that they didn't bring this analogy, but I, I want to bring it here. Yeah, the, the headset is the game itself, right? Yeah, it is it's, it's the well, it's the interface where the for consciousness, I mean, we as consciousness, uh, see uh, reality, this reality, yeah. but the the game itself is is the code. Yeah, I, yeah. I would relate to the code. So so when Donald Hoffman says we don't see reality as it is, I think it's, it can be said similar. Like we don't see the code, we right. see the game, but not the code. So we don't know how the the code or what code brings the game. So what what is it that brings the game? But because we can only study the game. Yeah, I, I, will, I will bring it as that analogy. I mean, the the universe is coded, and then we experience the output of of that code. Yeah, that, that's the in way some I sense. Say it. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I think maybe he's getting ahead of himself when he says that we don't perceive reality as it is i mean in some sense we do perceive the code as it is or like you said the game well, well, well game... we perceive the the output of the code but not the code we don't know the code the itself code, yeah. i yeah, mean we, we can we can that. speculate about the code because we we see the action of the code yeah but, but that that's how, how far we can go Anyway, uh, why don't you go ahead with uh, some other parts that you chose for? Sure, review? sure. Uh, tell you what. Um, yeah, he goes on to say, um, there's no theory on the planet artificial intelligence and a description of some kind of circuit or some kind of software pattern of activity and can give you a specific conscious experience like the taste of chocolate or the smell of garlic where you would say this pattern of activity must be identical, must be the taste of chocolate. Um, and it makes me think, I mean, do you want to go into it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, th I think he's conveying the fact that materialism doesn't really explain consciousness you know it, it why should um everything that the brain does 
uh, and and in this case artificial intelligence I, I don't know what your thoughts are on artificial intelligence but why should anything physical give rise to felt sensations of qualia it just there's you know I, I don't see any way that materialism can give us a full explanation of consciousness uh, to me it, it just conveys that there's an impasse there and uh, we need to to get over our um, our doctrine of materialism um but but then again I, i'll tell you something right um when it comes to um when it comes to, to uh, explaining consciousness, you, you hear this from materialists, usually from uh, people like Dan Dennett. And he, he's written a book called uh, Consciousness Explained. And uh, even his peers make fun of him and they say, well, the book should be called Consciousness Explained Away because you're not, you know, the book, don't get me wrong, it's a, it's a brilliant book and it does uh, go over the soft problems of consciousness. It, it goes over cognitive abilities and, and how the brain correlates and stuff like that. But it doesn't explain experience itself. You know, it doesn't explain, uh, you know, <laughs> what breathes fire into the equations, as Einstein would say. Yeah, you know, that's what, what is labeled as uh, the hard problem of consciousness. The, the hard problem of consciousness. And basically his book doesn't address the problem at all. So it, it just makes me think, but he does say something in the book, right? He does say, if there's going to, which, which makes sense, he says, if we're going to explain consciousness, we have to start from non-conscious elements, right? In order for that to be an explanation. How do you get to X? You have to start from something different, right? Which, which sounds logical. But then I think to myself, and, and here's the rub with panpsychism. If panpsychism is true, we will never have an explanation of consciousness because it's already there, right? It's fundamental. And it could, don't get me wrong, it could be true. But start from non-conscious elements and then he fails to get to consciousness. And I think to myself, if we're going to use his logic and it seems to be sound logic, then surely the same logic must apply when we are going to try to explain the physical world itself. If if the physical is to mean anything, then surely using the same logic in order to explain the physical world, you must start with something non-physical, you know, whatever that means. And if people are going to say, oh, well, what do you mean by non-physical? Well, what do you mean by physical? You know, because at, at the end of the day, if, if, when you talk about physical forces and, and matter, you're talking about observations you make about how things behave. Right. But you're not really talking about the essence. The essence is a mystery. You could you could say people usually say, oh, well, consciousness is a mystery. But, you know, not too long ago, there was a, a guy called uh, Gary. I can't remember his surname, but he actually flipped the argument. He said, actually, if you think about it, consciousness is what we know the most, what we know most intimately because we are it. And matter is actually what's mysterious. You could flip it around if you're going to say that you understand matter then consciousness becomes a mystery if you uh, embrace consciousness and and actually i am awareness you know i i whenever i'm unconscious i'm not there you know i could faint one minute and then wake up the next and and to me it's a it's like a continuous experience i can experience feeling faint and weak oh my god i'm gonna collapse but then the next moment I'm awake and then someone tells me oh you've been out for half an hour or in the case of comatose people you know they may, may be out for years but it may feel like you know they're out one minute and they're up the next and they haven't perceived time so it, th there is an underlying mystery there how it what happens at death that's what um, you know, what I questioned myself because it makes no sense that you will be in oblivion. You won't be, you know, there won't be an interruption of consciousness. Consciousness is, it has to be continuous forever. Does, does that make sense? I mean, is it me or? Yeah. But anyway, I, I don't want to deviate a lot from the, um, the review. Sure. The, sure. Let, let me see, let me tell you what I think about that 
portion. Um, what, what he's saying is that there's no a theory that can start from something physical um, or it, it creates something uh, in consciousness that is a, like a for sure one-to-one -one relationship. And like I modify this and exactly I get that. But one thing that I, I think everybody agrees, I mean, both materialists uh, and idealists, is that there is a correlation. There, there are correlations uh, because you might affect certain areas of the brain and consciousness yeah. changes. So basically, matters also affects mind. A mind affects matter. Wow. It, it's like uh, it goes both ways. Because if if we meditate, we we can lower the, our stress. We can lower depression. We can heal mentally. Uh, and and the other thing it also works uh, from from the physical, from uh, taking some pills, from drinking alcohol or Psychedelic taking drugs. It, it also affects uh, the mind. I was going to say about that very briefly. I know. Obviously, they haven't pulled, uh, you know, uh, they haven't pulled their materialism out of their rectums for no reason. I, I know they make the observation. Basically, they they conclude that the brain must somehow generate consciousness because, you know, in, in like 150 years of neuroscience, namely neurology, they observe that um, everything about the mind, every mental faculty, can be expunged via brain damage or cerebral malfunction. You know, you hit one area of the brain, you might lose the power of speech or mm -hmm. sight or the ability to recognize faces or name animals. So they they basically say once the brain is destroyed, how can anyone perceive uh, a colorful realm, a heavenly realm inhabited by deceased loved ones and they can see and hear them and and recognize their faces but basically they say well based on our observations we conclude that there can't be an afterlife it's it's you know either you either there's no afterlife or the afterlife is populated by people with all the brain deficits that's basically how they they look at it but i think right that the 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 cognitive abilities that we have yes there is some influence there, you know, by the brain, right? Whatever matter is, is somehow influencing and, and shaping the, the, how we feel about the world and the way we see the world, right? But I, I suspect, I strongly suspect, and I'm not saying that they should abandon materialism. I, I've, I really do believe that science should explore all avenues, materialism, uh, epiphysicalism, psychism, they should explore all areas, right? But I really do think that when they're talking about the mind being affected by the brain, they are not really addressing consciousness per se, because and, and even, you know, and they often say a good uh, blow to the back of your head can render you unconscious. Right. Mm. S uh, but I, I think they also don't understand uh, memory enough to be able to say that. Uh, we haven't experienced anything in that period of unconsciousness, right? Uh, it could be the case that we just forget. And when, when we identify with the brain or as human beings, that, uh, you know, whatever we experienced when we were out could be something to do with briefly seeing uh, beyond this, uh, you know, world. Could, could, be, could be briefly taken off, you know, the, the headset could be, to use Hoffman's analogy, it could falter very briefly and then you're forced to take off the headset and then you briefly see reality as it is and you have some type of uh, otherworldly experience, right. right? That's not the norm. And then you, you put the headset back on and then you're awake, you know, as they say, you're, you're so now that, conscious. That could, have, okay. that could be like an out-of-body experience, right? Yeah, yeah. That could include out of body experiences. It it could include, um, you know, an NDE, 
near-death experiences. It, it could, um, or or even a profound experience like you know, like the one I've, I've I've told you about, where you experience that pristine cognition. There's no, it's just pure awareness. I, I don't know if it's a return to to the one you you called it the void. It could even be that. Um, but perhaps people don't always remember these experiences. Unless you're paying attention to these experiences, unless you're engaging in meditation and you're you're practicing altered states of, of consciousness, like me and, and yourself, then I reckon most people won't remember these experiences. And then it, get, it just gets put down to, oh, the person was out. There was no experience whatsoever. If there's yeah, no I, brain it, activity. It is wrong to assume that there's no experience. Yeah. I mean, is the the saying absence of evidence is not evidence of absence? Yeah, so, that's right. Yeah, can you can we go to the third section that you had? What was the third section? The, this horror D. I don't know. I don't remember what it was, but the third portion. Oh, the third portion, yeah, yeah, I think, yeah. I think it's, uh, we are living in a simulation. Space Ted. time itself is not real. Yeah, space time is not real. We are effectively living inside of what you call the headset. Uh, that everything you've ever known or ever experienced is all effectively an illusion. Uh, it is a computer video game by way of analogy. So. I'm. I am not. <laughs> I am not sure that Hoffman is right, but I do find his view more convincing than than uh, materialism. Um, I do think, in some sense, it's a simulation, but I don't think I don't necessarily believe that we are like Neo that we're. We're in the matrix and, and, and in reality, there's another physical world out there and we're inside tanks filled with goo and we're plugged to machines and, you know, and one day we're going to wake up, wake up to the real world. I, I don't, I don't buy that, but it, it could be true. Um, when I read that, I think, yeah, it's interesting and, and it could actually be, a, it could actually potentially, if it, if it gets proved to be you know, true, it could potentially solve the the mind body problem. You know, the hard problem of it, it provides a solution, a possible solution to this. But to to be honest, the way I see things is, I can't I I can't be a hundred percent certain of anything, right? I, I see re reality. Uh, I think it feels like it's an objective world, like a world out there, but. It could be an illusion. I don't know. But there is one thing. There is one thing that can't possibly be an illusion. There is one thing that you can be 100 percent sure of, and that's consciousness. Nobody, right. you know, no, no, uh, no demon or mad scientist pulling the wool over your eyes about reality. No, you know, machines from the Matrix can take that away from you. They, it's undeniable. Nobody can deny to you that you are having an experience right now, that you're conscious. And when I hear eliminativists like Daniel Dennett say, oh, that consciousness is, isn't what it is, it's, it's actually an illusion. That makes no sense to me whatsoever. Same because <laughs> if, if, if you're going to say that consciousness is, is an illusion, then you have to say that the seeming is the reality, that the seeming is consciousness. And it just makes no sense. I'm sorry, you can't just explain it away. Consciousness is real. There is a deep mystery. Why is it that the lights are on right now in the physical universe? And I don't buy his explanation. 